Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the weekly roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. I have a couple of books to talk about this week, I'm just going to crack on with it. Sophie Vlogs! I'm going to start with a book that I read on my Kindle, and that is A Princess in Theory by Alyssa Cole. Um, I had a really lovely time reading this book. I think this is going to be the start of me really enjoying Alyssa Cole, because I have another one of her books on my Kindle to read in the future, and I think I will probably end up working my way through her stuff eventually. A Princess in Theory follows Nalady. She is a very scientific-minded, driven woman living in New York. She's working towards um, getting like a, a summer internship for her course. She has a background of um, bouncing through foster homes, which means that she can be quite um, guarded around people that she doesn't really know, but she she's really driven and I found her a really, I really enjoyed her as a main character. I thought that she was really like compelling. I could see the ways in which that um, because of her past she's been hurt and she builds up these walls, but once you're inside of the walls, you're inside of the walls and she cares about you. I just thought that she was such a compelling um, her like main character and also I loved seeing um, this woman who was passionate about science and scientific things and that sort of stuff and who was capable. Also the ways in which it's explicitly shown that because she's black and because she's a woman, the struggles that she has in the STEM field, they were like explicitly like shown and addressed and you can see them. Um, yes. Um, she keeps getting these emails that are telling her that she's um, the betrothed to this African prince that she thinks are just nonsense. They're true. So Prince Thabiso comes to America to, for other reasons, but while he's there, he's decided that he's going to track down this person and ask her why her parents abandoned their country and that sort of thing. When they meet, he suddenly realises that she has no idea who he is. Thus begins like a mistaken identity kind of romance. So he pretends to be an average person to sort of like see what she's like. And then romance ensues. One thing that I really appreciated with this book is that the murky and questionable morals associated with pretending to be someone you're not while also having a romantic relationship with someone were very explicitly like addressed. It was very much like there is a character who is um, the prince's personal assistant who very much calls him out on when he's being stubborn and when he's not being a considerate person and that sort of thing. And the problems that this whole ruse will have, although it is fun to read about if you think about it practically, like yes, pretending to be someone that you're not in order to have a relationship with someone is very uh, suspect. And I liked that that was addressed and that also it didn't go on too long. There is obviously this must be revealed at some point and then I appreciated that there was enough time after the reveal for Nalady to really like process her feelings and um, I don't know, there was time and communication given to sort of talk about the ways in which like that as a concept will be damaging when the truth is revealed and can you move past that and that sort of thing. I also really enjoyed when um, they ended up going back to um, Tabiso's country and just like this glimpse into this really interesting country and the way that it all worked. Um, I don't know, I just thought that this was, uh, I don't read a huge amount of romance but I've, I am starting to like dip my toe in a little bit more just for some like really nice light fluffy reads and this was one that I just thought was just really lovely and enjoyable. There's like an element in the second half of the book which um, I, I, I did think was quite obvious and easy to predict but sort of didn't bother me because I, I feel like you are supposed to kind of be suspicious and stuff like sometimes because you can predict stuff that's not necessarily bad it's just like yeah I've been given all of my clues and I can like draw an assumption based on it. Um, I don't know, I just, this was like everything I needed to read at the time that I read it. I had a really fun time, I'll definitely be reading more Alyssa Cole in the future, and it was a lot of fun. Um, after that is a piece of non-fiction. I also read The Wood, The Life and Times of Cockshirt Wood by John Lewis Stemple. Um, I've read a number of John Lewis Stemple by now. This was fine, it's not my favourite of his works. So. My actual favourite of his works is Meadowland, which traces like um, a year in the life of this particular meadow. He has a farm that's on the border between Hereford and Wales. And what I liked about Meadowland was um, I just found it really immersive. I really enjoyed like these changing of seasons and that sort of thing. There is a similarity in between these two books, except the, the form of this one is where I, I struggled a bit more. So whereas Meadowland is just like a narrative that takes you through the year. This is more like diary entries. So 
So as a result, sometimes it feels a little bit disjointed, partly because you kind of are just reading like, today's thought, today's topic, blah blah blah, which maybe if I had dipped in and out of this a bit more, maybe I prefer my nature writing to be slightly more of like a narrative tale rather than like a diary entry. So like, I learned some more fun things, I got another insight into some naturey stuff, it's just the form of this stopped me from really like rating this highly as a piece of nature writing and I think it's perfectly fine as like a diary of like these woods and I learned a lot more about how woods function versus meadows, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, perfectly fine, perfectly enjoyable, not the John Lewis stemple that I would recommend above all others, but if you are someone who enjoys his writing then I think you would still enjoy this. It kind of reminded me, to be honest with you, of a longer version of the small books that he does, so like The Secret Life of the Owl, The Secret Life of the Hare, those are very similar where it's like, here's some uh, folk history, here's some etymology, here's like blah, and it's just like lots of little snapshots except those are shorter and focused on one topic, whereas this is longer and focused on, like, the woods as a whole. So, like, I don't know, not bad, just, like, not my favourite. After that are some comics, which I read and I had a really great time with. So I read, um, I don't know if they're too shiny for you to see, these are um, Labyrinth Coronation um, by Spurrier, Bayliss and Jackson. There are uh, 12 issues total, and um, they're just, they're, they're um, riffing off of the film Labyrinth. I had such a good time with these. They're essentially telling you Jareth's backstory. It's, it's alternating between um, Jareth as he is in the Labyrinth film, sort of um, telling the story of his life back to um, baby Toby, and then also um, there are also aspects of it which don't feel like they're being told by Jareth, they're being told by someone else who was sort of there. Um, it was really interesting to A, read about this backstory. Jareth's backstory is, is very tied to what happens in the Labyrinth film, so it's, it's, all, it's like there is um, Jareth's mother is going through the Labyrinth to try and find him you kind of know that something's not going to go to plan by the fact that he is the Goblin King. So you have this awareness of sort of like, okay, well, what's going to go wrong at like all times? Um, Jarrah's mother is so compelling. She, there are a lot of similarities between her and Sarah, but also like she's very much, she is different enough to be her own character. Um, the cast of characters that built up is fantastic. I am so attached to these characters. They are different from the cast that you have in the Labyrinth films, but I feel as connected to them. There's like this rose bush who is like conscious and just wants to give people hugs, but obviously thorny thorningtons. I have a lot of feelings about that. Um, there's a, the tiny, you know, like the worm from the original Labyrinth? There's like a tiny worm character who is like leading a revolution and that sort of thing. I just, the cast was so endearing and they gave me so many emotions. I think my favourite thing about this, without giving any spoilers, um, the way that the narrative goes is you end up with these moments and you're like, I cannot figure out if this is a good thing or not. So the ending of this, and I won't tell you what the ending is, but I will tell you that the ending made me feel so conflicted, because I, I was like, you could read this like a happy ending, but equally, there is something so hauntingly sad about it, and that as itself, I just like, I finished it, and I was like, oh god, I have emotions to process, and then as I was thinking about it, I was like, this entire comic series is built on the fact that I'm supposed to be trusting everything that Jareth is telling me, despite the fact that in these breaks between telling the story and Jareth is interacting with like a little goblin and stuff like that, um, the goblin who was there does point out things that were different than how he's told them. So like, do I take anything that's been told to me in this series as true and as fact? Is it all a lie? Are there partial truths? If there are partial truths, what is the truth? Is it all the truth? I just don't know. And I just think that that's so in keeping with Labyrinth. You know, like there is an element of the, of the Labyrinth film where you're like, um, especially at the end when you have in Sarah's room and you see all the things and how like, you're like, oh, was it all a dream? Because I can see all these elements in her bedroom that could add up to make this dream. Or is it true? And it's all these, and like, the way that that film leaves you with questions, this series left me with questions, and I just 
had the best time. If you like Labyrinth, I would really recommend you checking out this series. It's one that I think, I know sometimes um, prequels and stuff, you're like, oh, does this add anything, blah, blah, blah. This actually does add something to me, and it um, is in keeping with a lot of the original whilst also developing it. I don't know, I just had, like, the best time, and it's left me with all of these thoughts and feelings. Um, I would really recommend it, I thought it was really great. Uh, finally, I'm just going to briefly mention a book that I actually DNF'd, and I'm a little bit disappointed about it, so I just thought I would talk about it. Um, I DNF'd The King Must Die by Mary Reno, um, which is Mary Reno's book about Theseus. I really like Mary Reno, I have read a number of Mary Reno by now, and I have really enjoyed them. Something about this, this is the second time I've tried to read this book, I think I got about 70 pages in this time, which is further in than I got last time, um, I struggle. The opening of this book is quite slow, um, which sometimes I like because Mary Reno is really good at giving you, like, grounding you in, like, the time and place. So she does a lot of books that are set in, like, uh, classical antiquity and stuff. I've read um, one about Samoides, stuff like that. Um, this is about Theseus, and it's going to be about Theseus becoming king and slaying the Minotaur and all that sort of stuff. About 70 pages in, I was like, God, are we going to get anywhere? Because it really starts when he's a kid. And I, I felt immersed in the society. I just also, it was just a bit slow. And Theseus as a character is not very likeable, which I think is probably fair, because I think a lot of these uh, Greek heroes as main characters would not be likeable. But just, I think that combination of um, me not really connecting with Theseus, he feels a bit like uh, stuck up and conceited and blah, and then also just like this slow pace. I've just, I've tried it twice now, and I love classical things, that sort of thing, but I just, something's not working for me for this, so I'm gonna DNF it, <laughs> and like, try some more Rary Reno again in the future, because I have really liked her stuff in the past. I think maybe this just isn't my right moment, but I wanted to mention it because I did read like a bit, and I would like to hear if you are someone who reads Mary Reno, like, did you have a similar thing? Is it actually really good and really worth reading? Do I just need to push through like, I don't know, like another 30 pages to get like 100 pages in? I just was like, how far in do you get when you're really not feeling something, you know? But yes. Um, that's everything that I want to talk about this week. I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these, um, any recommendations you have that are like similar things, all of that and more. Um, yes, do let me know in the comments down below, but otherwise I hope you're having a lovely day and I'll see you next time for something different.